there were shepherds. And I'd like for us just to look tonight. We're in Luke chapter two. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. One thing that uh, I'd like to mention here, uh, Caesar Augustus thought he uh, had come up with a novel idea. What he didn't realize was that he was fulfilling prophecy uh, that had been given hundreds and hundreds of years ago that, uh, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. And it took a taxing and a census to make the people go back to their hometown that made Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem so that Jesus could be born. It just reminds me, as Solomon tells us uh, in his word, that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. You know, we have these leaders that come through and, and they think they're all high and mighty, they're all powerful, they can do anything they want to, and a lot of times they do, but I've got news for you. They may get by down here. I heard somebody say this week that uh, uh, Mr. Biden and his son, boy, they were in deep trouble. I, I, uh, I don't look for much to come to that. I, I don't think they're, they're going to do much about that. They may get by with it down here, but I've got news for you. There's one judge that they're not going to be able to buy off. There's one judge they're not going to be able to skirt by, and that's the God of all God and the King of all kings. And though we may seeming like we get by down here, God has everything under control. And so all went to be taxed first for everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. I shared with you this morning, verse five should not be. Uh, first, verse five, uh, this, this is never supposed to happen to have an espoused wife or to have an engaged wife being great with child. Now the Jews will use this against Jesus later on when he starts his ministry. He begins to, uh, he begins to call them out on their sins. And uh, some people talk about Jesus was the sweet, lowly Nazarene. Yes, but he had a backbone like a saw log too. He looked at that group of, of uh, uh, Jews and he said, you're nothing but whited sepulcher full of dead men's bones. you thieves, you snakes, you vipers. Boy, he didn't call them. He didn't worry about it. But they would use this to accuse Jesus of being illegitimately born, of not having a a legal birth with a mother and a father that were married. And of course we know that Mary was conceived of the Holy Spirit and that the birth of Jesus was a virgin birth. Hey, real quick, turn in your Bibles over to Genesis chapter three. Genesis three. Let me just show you something about this virgin birth. I'm gonna run a rabbit. Miss Dean said my rabbit running is better than my preaching, so we'll just uh, we'll see what happens there. All right, Genesis chapter three: Adam and Eve have fallen; they have uh, eaten of the fruit. And God comes as He did every day in the cool of the evening to fellowship with them, and they've hid out; they're hiding out in the bushes. And God comes and gets them out and confronts them with their sin, and God condemns and God judges. He puts a curse on the, on the uh, animal kingdom. He puts a, a special curse on the snake. He puts a curse on the earth. He puts a curse on women. He puts a curse on man. But let me show you something in Genesis chapter three and verse 15. And uh, God's speaking to Adam and Eve and he's speaking now of I will put enmity between thee, the serpent or Satan, and the woman. And so God says to uh, Satan that has uh, taken the form of a serpent in the garden, he said, I'm gonna put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. You need to underline or circle those two words in your Bible. Her seed. 
her seed. This is the only time in the Bible that that's used. As a matter of fact, the Bible is very, very straightforward and plain that the seed comes from the man, not from the woman. The seed of man. Now, you'll see that all throughout the Bible. The seed of man. But here, he says he's gonna put enmity between the devil and the devil's crowd and the seed of the woman. And what he's saying here, yeah, this is the first time that the thought of, of a woman uh, having a child and, and being clean and pure and it being done of God and the Holy Ghost, he's saying that seed is going to be placed inside of Mary and it's going to be done by the Holy Spirit of God, a miracle, a miraculous thing that God did that a virgin should conceive and bear a son and God told Adam and Eve about it back in the garden right, uh, in the garden of Eden. He said, I'm gonna put enmity and we know that there's been warfare between Satan and his followers and Christ Jesus and his. And so go back to Luke chapter two. He said, and he said, and, and to be taxed, verse five, with Mary, his espouse wife being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And so Jesus now has been born. He's been born in a, in a, a, a stable. He's been born in a manger. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes, which are are uh, rags that they used to wrap the dead, the indigent, those that were too poor to have a, a proper funeral. They would wrap them in these swaddling clothes, these rags. And this is what Jesus was wrapped in, death clothes, and laid in a manger, the Lamb of God, because there was no room for them in the end. And verse eight, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I shared with you this morning the thought that Jesus now is announcing the birth of his son. God has hung a star in the heavens, a special star, a bright star, a star that had never been there before. Its illumination had never been there before. And it's a great star that started that night that Jesus was born. That star was shining for the whole world to announce the Savior, the Lord Jesus, has come. And then God sends his angel and a, a multitude of the heavenly hosts will join him and to announce and to declare and to uh, make uh, known on this earth that Jesus has been born. And I shared with you this morning that he came to the shepherds in verse number eight of Luke chapter two. He made his announcements to the shepherds. I said this morning that shepherds were common and low class. Uh, shepherds were looked down on by society. Most of the time they smelled bad. Most of the time their dress was bad. Most of the time they were of a baser sort and they were looked down upon by civilization. They were looked down upon by society. They were uh, no one in the eyes of the world. They were nobodies. They were the lowest of the low anybody 
If they worst out being anything else, you could always get a job as a shepherd. And they were the lowest of the low. But yet it was the shepherds that God sent the angel to make his announcement to. And beloved, I believe with all my heart, God is showing us through that that anybody can be saved. It's not just for the rich. It's not just for the religious. It's not just for the, uh, for the proud. It's not just for the educated. Jesus came to die for the entire world so that whosoever could come and take of the water of life freely. God came to the shepherds. The angel came to the shepherds and made his announcement that Jesus had been born. Now, the Bible said they were abiding. and They were in the same country, shepherds abiding. I shared with you this morning, I want to give you three reasons why God came to the shepherds we see that they were abiding in the fields. The word abiding means to remain stable or fixed. To just be where you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be doing. They were abiding in the field. Now, three things I want to share with you tonight. First of all, they were where they were supposed to be. They were where they were supposed to be. The Bible said, and they were in the same country, shepherds abiding in the field. I wonder if one of the shepherds had called in sick, if one of the shepherds had laid out drunk, if one of the shepherds had run off and, and had turned his job in, he would not have been there and he would not have been party to this great announcement that the angel of the Lord would bring and that the holy angels, a multitude of the heavenly host, listen, he came to the shepherds because they were where they were supposed to be. And beloved, God blesses faithfulness. Just find out where God wants you and then just stay there. Do what you're supposed to do where God has you to be. I've never seen a time when people were so fickle as they are today. It seems like nothing satisfies some people. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what changes or, or what improvements they're not happy with anything. You know, it's a, it's a pitiful life that people live never putting down roots, never, never being where they're supposed to be. Beloved, I know tonight, if I fell over dead behind this pulpit where I'm preaching, I know tonight beyond all shadow of a doubt, I am 100% confident that I'm where God wants me to be. He wants me pastor in the White Horse Heights Baptist Church. And no matter what else I do or where else I go, I know this is where God would have me. And beloved, God sent his angel to these shepherds, number one, because they were where they were supposed to be. I wonder tonight, are we where we're supposed to be? You know, I remember an old preacher saying years ago, that there's no peace for a Christian. There's no peace outside the will of God for our life. I had an uncle that was, was fairly gifted in, in a, a talent. He was a, a baseball player. As a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, he went through North Greenville and uh, there were some minor leagues that were watching him and uh, talking about... Uh, drafting him, talking about bringing him into the minors. He was that good. But God was calling him to preach. And, uh, and so he is running from the Lord. And God said, I want you to preach. And he said, I don't believe I want to. And so one day, he's in uh, center field and a fly ball is hit. And he's running at, as fast as he can to get to the ball and he doesn't see the, the other outfielders running and they collide in the middle of the field. And when it did, it mangled my, my uncle up. It broke some bones and uh, his teeth came through his lips and almost broke, almost cut his lip off and it was a horrible time. 
And uh, my uncle told me later, he said he was laying in the hospital. I believe he had a broke leg and maybe some cracked ribs and his face had to be stitched up and he had boogered himself up pretty good. And he said, laying in that hospital bed, look, he couldn't, couldn't move over, his in traction and uh, had his leg up on a sling and stuff. He said he, he told the Lord, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll go where you want me to go. Now, beloved, tonight, listen to me. There, there is a place God has for you. And there is no, there'll be no peace in your life until you get where God wants you to be and just stay. Just put your roots down. D drive the tent stakes all the way in. Don't always be looking like Dorothy for the land over the rainbow. Hey, listen, if you get over there, you'll find out there's no place like home. There's no place like home. Hey, the shepherds were blessed of God and received the announcement because they were where they were supposed to be. Number two, they were doing what they were supposed to do. The Bible said they were keeping watch. They were keeping watch. They were watching the sheep. Beloved, tonight I wonder, are, are we here tonight and are we not only where God wants us to be, but are we doing what God wants us to do? Now listen, God will never ask you to do anything that you cannot do. Amen? God will never ask you to do anything that you cannot do. Now listen, he may ask you to do things you may not think you can do, but if God tells you to do it, he will equip you, he will empower you, he will give you what you need to do what he wants you to do. Hey, I'm glad tonight we have a God, a beloved that equips us and empowers us and fills us so that we can serve him and do what he wants us to do tonight. I wonder, like the shepherds, are we where we're supposed to be? And number two, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? So many people run from the call of God. They run from what God wants them to do. And God may not be calling you to be a preacher tonight. God may not be calling you to, to be a missionary or be an evangelist or, or, or something else. But God has got something for all of us to do. He hadn't just left you on this earth just because you're a great person and he just likes having you around. No, sir. You're here because there is a purpose for your life. There is a purpose. God has left you here. God has kept you here to do something that only you can do. Beloved, I wonder tonight, are we doing what God wants us to do? It's so sad tonight that people take talent and they use their talent for themselves and for the world and they, they sell out for a dollar or they sell out for popularity or they sell out for power and they, they uh, reject what God wants them to do. They're gonna be the boss. They're gonna build a name. They're gonna have something. They're gonna amount to something. And they, they forget the Lord and they go their own way. They may make a bunch of money. They may rise to the president. They may be the most popular person on earth, but I promise you this, they'll never be satisfied in their soul because they're not doing what God wants them to do. God will never ask you to do anything that, he, uh, that, that you cannot do and that he doesn't equip you to do. I think of Moses when God was talking to Moses out of the burning bush and Moses was arguing with God and, and said, God, if I go back, they, they won't believe me. And, and whom shall I say sent me? And he said, tell them the I am sent you. He said, well, I, I don't know about that. And God said, Moses, what is that in thy hand? Moses said, a shepherd's rod, a staff. He said, throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground and it became a viper, a viper, an asp, probably a cobra. That was what was in Egypt at that time and in, those, uh, in the deserts, probably a cobra, a deadly snake with just one bite can kill you. And his rod becomes a snake. And then God said, uh, pick up the snake. And he picked up the snake and it turned back into the rod. He asked Moses, Moses, what is that in thy hand? 
It was just a shepherd's rod, but God was going to use that shepherd's rod to lead two and a half or three million Jews out of slavery and lead them up to the door of the promised land. You think of little jail, the, uh, the children of Israel, Joshua was fighting the Assyrians. And boy, they're just, they're, they're outnumbered 10 to one. And God has the angel of the Lord come down and he, he uh, dispenses with the army. And old Sisera, he's a, evil king. He gets away. And boy, they knew if he got away, he'd get back down to Assyria. He'd gather another army and he'd come back and do it to him again. They had to kill him. They had to get rid of him. There was no, uh, there was, uh, no uh, a question about it. Sisera's got to die. And, uh, but he gets by him, Bill. He slips by him. And they can't find him. And they said, oh my soul, we'll be going through all this again in a year or two. He'll gather another army. And Sisera's running for his life. And he's running and he's running and he's so tired. And he comes up and there's a little camp, a little tent. And he walks in and a little fire and there's a little young maid by the name of Jael. J-A-E-L. And when he came up, she knew exactly who he was. She knew that was Sisera king of the Assyrians. And so she said, come on in here. You look so weary. You look so tired. He said, could you give me just a drink of cold water? She said, I'll do better than that. Here, sit down right here in this comfortable chair. And she gave him some cool milk. And she said, I tell you what, I, I believe you'd be more comfortable. Come in here and just lay down on this little pallet I've got. And she stroked his head as he drunk that milk. And he was so exhausted. He was so tired. And boy, that milk just uh, did something for him and he fell into a deep sleep. And here this sweet, young, uh, it had to be a real young maid, she got a hammer and she got a tent stake and while Jael was laying there asleep, she took that tent stake and put it on his temple and drove it through his head and killed him uh, in that tent. What was that? What's that in your hand, little girl? Oh, it's just a hammer and a tent stake. What can you do with one stake? What can you do with just one stake? You can't put a tent up. You can't uh, build any kind of a structure. Just one little stake. Yeah, but it's all I need to kill a king with. It was all I needed to drive his head in the ground and uh, through both sides and out the other side. I killed a general that the army couldn't kill. I took care of him with a hammer and a nail. What is that in thy hand? Martha, what is that in your hand, darling? It's just some pots and pans. Well, what are you doing? I'm fixing Jesus a meal. You're what? Oh, yeah. Whenever he's around Bethany, he always stops in and we fellowship with him and I'm making him a meal. I'm preparing him a nice meal. And, uh, well, why don't you, Mary's in there at his feet worshiping. Why don't you go in there with her? I understand, but I'll let her worship. I'm gonna make him a meal. I'm gonna have something good for him to eat. Well, it sounds so much like my grandma, Dean, and my, and my mama, Ma. You never went down there that you didn't have to eat something. It didn't matter if you went back two or three o'clock in the morning. You had to have something to eat. And they'd fix you something. Always had something that could warm up or, or fix you. Martha, what in the world? Who, uh, who do you think you are? Just a pot in a pan. I'm a nobody, but I fed my Savior. I fed him a nice meal. Did it more than once. I took care of my Jesus. Beloved, tonight, whatever God puts in our hand, that's what he expects us to use to serve him with. We're all not alike. Brother Lee here, not Brother Scott, he's a mechanic. He works on automobiles. If I, had to, if I had to open a shop and be a mechanic, Ms. Dean, I'd starve to death in about 30 days. I can't hardly figure out which end of a wrench to put the, uh, a socket on. And uh, I never will forget, I was trying to ch uh, change my brakes on my car. I would just got a Lincoln town car. and I I'd, I'd replaced the brakes on my Chevrolets, but I'd never had a Ford. And, and I was trying to get the, uh, uh, the calipers off. And I had me, a, had me a wrench and a socket, 
and I couldn't get it. And so I put a cheater bar on it. I couldn't get it. And my neighbor was driving home from work. He was a mechanic. And I had that thing and I was, uh, I was stepping on it, Carl, trying to get those caliper bolts to break loose. And I couldn't get them. Oh, I was so angry and frustrated. No dink stopped by and he walked up and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to get this caliper bolt off. He said, you're turning it the wrong way. I said, what? He said, Ford automobiles, they, they go the opposite way. The bolts do it. I was tightening instead of trying to loosen it. I'm no mechanic. You put a wrench in my hand and I'll starve to death. You put a hammer in my hand and I'll starve to death. I don't know how to build. I don't know how to fix cars. But isn't it wonderful that God hadn't called me to do that? God's called me to preach the word of God. And he equips and he blesses each one of us so that we can do what we're supposed to do. The, the shepherds got the announcement from Jesus because number one, they were where they were supposed to be. Number two, they were doing what they were supposed to do. And number three, they were doing it when they were supposed to be. It said and they were keeping watch over their flock by night, by night. Boy, night time's when the critters come out. Night time is when the animals come out that would attack the sheep and kill them. Oh, some may come out during the day, but most of the animals, they lay wait and they hide out in the darkness and they attack at night. And uh, it's hard to catch them, but the uh, shepherd, they would watch their sheep by night, and all night long, they'd keep the fire going, and they'd watch to make sure that the sheep were taken care of. They were, they were where they were supposed to be. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing when they were supposed to be doing it. I'll, I'll never forget back in Virginia, I, I, I raised chickens. I had chickens just about the whole time I was in Virginia. I loved them, and and I was, I was losing some at night. And you, I'd hear them, I'd hear the hen house going crazy. I'd grab my shotgun and the lamp at light and I'd run out there. By the time I got out there, there'd just be a pile of feathers and one of my good laying hens was gone. And uh, oh, it just hacked me to no end. One Sunday night after church, one of my men was over at the house. We'd started the church in our home and, and uh, all of a sudden I heard the chickens. I grabbed my shotgun, I grabbed my flashlight and out to the hen house we went. And my buddy came with me, Brother Mark Higginbotham. Some of you may hear me talk about him on the radio. And uh, we got out there and, and looked, and there was nothing there. I said, I can't figure this out. This is about the fourth time I've been out here, and I don't know how in the world something can get uh, out of the pen and gone without me hear it running down through the woods. And so uh, he, co he commenced to click and uh, making a strange noise. And all of a sudden I heard a noise and I shined that light up in that tree and it was a raccoon sitting up in that tree and had one of my chicken, one of my hens by the neck. And I said, he said, that's what's been doing it. He hadn't been running, he'd been running up a tree till you go back in and then he comes down. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, we're gonna, we're gonna send him to his great beyond tonight. And uh, I had double alt buck, three inch magnum shells in that shotgun. And I cut down on that raccoon and he cut three flips and he hit the ground. Well, he hit the ground and he raised up on his back two legs and he started at me. I said, Marcus, this raccoon's got the devil in him. Look at him. I done blowed him out of this tree and here he comes. So I cut down on him again, blue. And I blew one of his arms off and he, he cut a flip backwards and Carly got up again and he was coming at me with that one paw he had left. I said, oh my soul, this thing is demon possessed. We better get out of here. I had one shell left and I, I cut out on him and that put him down for good. And uh, I was never so glad to, uh, to know that that coon was dead and, it, and that took care of my chicken problem. I didn't lose any more chickens after that. But it was always at night, always when it got dark where you couldn't see what was going on. And beloved, these shepherds, they were in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. It was nighttime and they weren't asleep. The Bible said they were watching, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
I want to ask you tonight in closing, uh, as, as God has blessed the shepherds for their abiding, are you where God wants you to be? Are you doing what God wants you to do? And are you doing, are you serving God when you're supposed to be? Are you faithful to the Lord tonight? Are you where, what, when? It's all those question marks that they checked off. And beloved, tonight, uh, let's, let's get in the fight. Let's get busy about doing what God has for us to do. The old uh, poet said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It's the only thing we're going to take with us is what we've done for Jesus. We're going to leave our cars, we're going to leave our houses, we're going to leave our clothes, we're going to leave our fortunes behind, and we're going to a land that's fairer than day. And when I stand before my sweet Savior, I want him to, I want him to be able to say, you are abiding where you were supposed to be. Our Father, I pray tonight that you'll help us. Thank you for this wonderful thought of these shepherds and the fact that you didn't come to the palace, you didn't come to Wall Street, you didn't meet with a bunch of bankers, you sent your angels down to these commonplace shepherds. And I pray tonight you'll help us to be faithful over what you've called us to do. Help us, God, to be where we're supposed to be. Help us to be doing what we're supposed to be doing and help us, God, to uh, be faithfully and, and serving you when we're supposed to be serving you. Oh, God, use now thy word tonight to find a resting and a lodging place in our lives and we'll thank you and we'll praise you for you ask it in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed and no one's looking around. Let's stand to our feet. If there's a need in your heart, I invite you to come. If you'd like to talk to the Lord tonight, you step out and come. We'll tarry just a moment while you come and uh, let's, let's abide tonight. Let's make sure we're doing what the Lord would have us do. As we tarry, you mind the Lord tonight. Thank you. You may be seated. Ushers, come. Let's make ready to receive the tithes and offerings of God's people tonight. I have a gift here that was given to me this week, and I couldn't put it in this morning because uh, I didn't have change. They gave me some big bills, and so I was able to break that, and I'll be able to present this to the Lord for them tonight. And so you be faithful in giving to the Lord a portion of what he's blessed you with. And it's so good to... Uh, as we said, have Tim and Sharon back with us tonight. Brother Kevin, would you ask a blessing on the offering tonight, please? Well, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate your faithfulness to the Lord and I hope and pray you'll have a great week. As we say, we look forward. We'll be back here on Wednesday night at seven and we'll continue our Bible study and prayer meeting. We look forward to that. 
And then Friday night will be the children's home uh, uh, banquet, dinner, supper. We look forward to uh, having them. And so uh, you do your best now. On the way out, there's a table out front. We have some of the gifts from our bookstore and all the proceeds from our bookstore goes to the radio. And so you can help us. We have some beautiful Christmas pins for the ladies. We have some box greeting cards. We have some of the Bible, some of our Schofield. We got in, I've never been able to offer this, 40 years on the radio, 42 years on the radio. And uh, I've never been able to offer the uh, cowhide leather Schofield. This is the finest Bible, Schofield Bible, that Oxford University Press puts out. You've got bonded leather and you've got genuine, but this is cowhide leather. And uh, we uh, unboxed it, and, and uh, I just wanted to smell it. Boy, it just smells so good, at cowhide leather. So stop by and uh, see, and uh, we'll appreciate that. As we dismiss in prayer, let's stand to our feet. We'll ask God to dismiss us as we go. Brother Tim.